you know, divine providence, you know, and karma, you know, which are, you know, two ways of saying the same thing, you know, come into play in the world, right? In other words, it's very, very clear when, you know, I've read a whole bunch of stuff on this over the years, just on airplanes, you know, that's when I generally read this kind of thing, you know, just like foreign affairs, you know, those kind of magazines. Now, the Jeb Bush clearly was, you know, the favorite son. He was the talented son. He was the son who did the right stuff. You know, he was the son who followed the rules. He was the son who made dad proud. You know, and oh my God, George became president. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's a, it's a wild story. And how that happens in the world, you know, it's just one of the ways we see that there's just larger forces operating. I know in Israel, I don't want to mention the name of the person, send him great blessings, but there's a person who became, you know, a minister in the government that I knew, you know, fairly well, who when I knew him, he had kind of come to New York and couldn't really get it together and it was, you know, Give, was a Rosh Hashiva. He was teaching in different yeshivas, but didn't really show up for class to teach and didn't really like it. And he was kind of the son who didn't really know how to do it. He mm-hmm. couldn't quite get it together. And all his other brothers, like major stars, you know, in Israeli society. And, and he came back to Israel. And again, because he didn't really get it together, so he would kind of go to settlers' meetings. You know what I mean? In other words, and, yeah. and little by little, you know, in this kind of vacuum, he became just, you know, he was the guy who showed up you know, the leader of the settlers movement and ultimately became, you know, a major minister. And it was just kind of, it was, it was one of the great Shakespearean absurdities about how that happens. You know, how these things happen and how we get where we get in life and what moves us and what, when we rise and when we, when we fall and when we have kind of huge surges of success and when we kind of have, you know, periods of just, you know, you know of, of failure, you know, and of crisis, you know, in a certain sense, you know, of course, we create all our reality you know, true and bullshit, you know, in other words, not true, you know, there's a larger force that kind of moves through, and I thought that was actually something deeply true in the movie, in other words, words, you couldn't quite track in the movie, how did this man become president? Right. Right, like, you know, in other words, it was like, hello? But, I mean, even Oliver Stone couldn't quite, like, I mean, becoming president, I mean, it's a serious thing. Yeah. And I'm starting a new organization, and that's a good thing, and I hope we're going to have, you know, beautiful national impact, and you're running your blog, and that's fantastic, but, you know, becoming president's even more complex than that. <laughs> the man became, you know, yes, he was George Bush Sr.'s son. So in that sense, I kind of, you kind of saw this kind of, this larger hand in history, you know, a larger frame of meaning in which people kind of have a sense of being fully autonomous, living their destinies, but actually, you know, that living of destiny and autonomy is part of a larger, you know, vision of history. And although that wasn't obvious in the movie, what you saw in the movie is that Oliver Stone himself couldn't quite figure out how did this man become president? You know, and that, that kind of larger sweep in history and how, how our own individuality is actually part of a larger, a larger scheme, a larger hand, right, a larger vision, you know, that kind of just set me thinking in the movie again about that, which is, of course, a core idea, you know, in, in Hebrew religion, that God's also a God of history. You know, and that, that, that was also a kind of big theme in the movie. Yeah, uh, I had some thoughts on the portrayal of religion in the movie. I, I did not relate to the the Christianity, which is a major theme in, in the movie, and uh, right. this whole notion of that the one is called. Uh, uh, about a week before I watched the movie, I saw a a commercial on YouTube that starred a young Russell Crowe, and he was in a commercial for Avondale College, which is the Seventh Day Adventist College where I grew up mm. and it's all, it's all about the ministry you have to feel a call from God to it and uh, it just seems so uh, unreliable I mean from from a Jewish perspective we we believe that <laughs> the, the last time that God like called people was uh, I think Mika the the prophet uh, the, the prophecy ended essentially about 2400 years ago and we don't rely on that uh, in fact we strongly distrust uh, people acting just because they feel called by God. It's not the way we talk, and it's not the way we think, and we don't overturn Jewish law, and we don't, uh, you know, we don't make major decisions based on, you know, we believe that God told us something, and so I don't relate to that. Here, yeah. here, you're, here you're betraying both your um, Lithuanian misnagdish, mitnag, they would call it, you know, tendencies, and also I would say your Pregarian tendencies. <laughs> in, other words, right. in, other words, in other words, you're expressing, you know, very well, as you often do, one side of the story, right? There is a side of it that's kind of like saying God's not in trees, right? There is a side of the story that says what you just said, that is to say, right, 
you know, the famous, you know, you know, Talmudic passage, you know, it's not in heaven, right? right. You, know, there's, you know, this famous Talmudic debate, and the rabbis kind of have their opinion, and a voice from the heavens comes out and says, no, it's really this way, you know, and, and Joshua stands up and says, you know, Loba Shemaimi, it's not in heaven. So, so that, that, that notion of kind of human autonomy, and we're not guided by divine voices, is a moment in Talmudic thought, but there's an equally strong moment in as many passages, and this moment became very powerful in Kabbalah, and particularly in Hasidism. And Hasidism is, as of course you know, as a man who dhammas in Chabad occasionally, right, is not a peripheral movement in which actually, the, you know, the sense of the individual being called, the sense of the individual hearing the call, but is actually very powerful. As a matter of fact, the, the Zohar, you know, reads the text, and God called Abraham and said, you know, go to the land as an actual perpetual call to every individual human being in a different way, and that what made Abraham special is that not that he was called, but that he responded to the call, right? So, so that kind of split, you know, which is, is the kind of thing that, you know, that, that you hear in certain kind of ethical, monist, rational Jewish circles is, is correct in that it captures a certain Jewish sensibility. I want to honor that. I'm not, uh, you know, it, it does capture sensibility. What you're saying is real, but, you know, as is often the case, it's only half the story, and complexity is in some sense to hold them both meaning not to get lost in the intoxication of the call. You know, there's a danger to the call, you know, <laughs> as Ram Dass used to say, and how do you know it's not the plumber? You know, in other words, right. you know, who's calling, right? And so, so the ability to be, you know, you, know, you know, Freud always said, right, man's ability to be a genius, right, is the genius of self-deception, right? And so there's, there's a danger, you know, to the, in the intoxication of the call and, and the idea of just kind of living an ethical life, living a good life, and if you make a mistake, you know, picking yourself up again, transforming and evolving further and then doing it again and again, you know, constant, you know, challenge to live ethically, do tshuva, live ethically again. That's the Jewish cycle, right? We do tshuva every day, meaning we repent every day for whatever we've done wrong. Every year we do, you know, a kind of account of that year and we treat, keep trying to, you know, spiral upwards in ethical behavior, you know, based on a very this world kind of focus on how we live. Yes, that's all true. And, you know, and inspiration is real, you know, and the call is real. You know, and, and, you know, what's actually interesting, if you think about it, this is something that Rabbi Soloveitchik pointed out many, many years ago. Most of the great decisions of your life are not guided by halacha. That's one of the things that the, the, the ultra-Orthodox world, but it's one of my huge, you know, when I, you know in, my, in my classical days 20 years ago when I was kind of very, very involved in the Orthodox community, you know, when I would debate with the ultra-Orthodox community, if you will, it was about this issue. They would say everything is covered by halacha. But right. actually, it's not true, right? right. Who you marry? You know, whether you get divorced or not, where you decide to live, what profession you decide to engage, right? You know, and it's actually the largest decisions of your life are actually not defined by Jewish law, right? You actually have to go inside and, you know, and, and find the voice that guides you. And, you know, and that voice that guides you ultimately is divinity, right? And that's, that, that's the place where the inside meets the outside. So, so I, I bow to the way you, 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 you kind of express that particular moment. I just want to add the other side to it with 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 respect and love. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think you 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 summed it up pretty well. I'll move on to one other point. Um, I heard this from TV producer and TV writer Rob Long. It says to think about the presidential campaigns as Americans casting for the for the leading role in their country. And I'm a right wing Republican. I definitely voted a straight ticket Republican uh, this year, as I have every election cycle. But uh, I have to say, if you, if I'm casting for the the leading role in this country, that Barack Obama has a far more presidential, um, not intellect, or persona. Um, you know the McCain. You know I'd like I'd I'd prefer watching on TV Barack Obama for the next four years than John McCain. That the McC- uh, Obama has not just a first class intellect, but a first class temperament. In, in in the words of uh, of Charles Krauthammer, and so even though I don't agree with him on almost anything, there is like a calmness and a as a and a presidential manner uh, to him that I think. You know, most Americans would agree with, and and if they look at politics as casting for the leading role in their country, um, that's as good a reason as any why he's probably going to win tonight. No, I, th- I think that's right, and you know, and so again, you know, a, a bow to Obama in the sense of a you know a bow in the sense of a prayer, you know, and it's at this point, you know, whether someone voted Obama or McCain, it's in everybody's interest that Obama succeed, 
right? It's you know, it's a, you know, a model succeed not as a person. This is 